Our Old Testament lesson for today comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 1 to 11. Comfort. O oh, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. A voice cries out, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all my people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely. The people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain. O Zion, herald of good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings, lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord comes with might, and his arm rules for him, and his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms, and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead the mother's sheep. We thought it might be fun to do something we haven't done in a minute. So for those who are able, please stand for the reading of the gospel. This gospel lesson comes from Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, John was clothed with camel hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The word of God for the people of God. Be Thanks be to God. Please be seated. I'm pretty sure everybody has um, a something that it doesn't feel like Christmas unless it happens thing. Now, it doesn't feel like Christmas unless you could have a number of things that would go there. Like it doesn't feel like Christmas unless you go to this particular event that you always go to. It doesn't feel like Christmas unless you prepare this particular meal that you always prepare or... Or maybe uh, it doesn't feel like Christmas unless I, that, you know, I wear that particular ugly Christmas sweater three times during the season. I think we all probably have something like that. If you do have something that comes to mind and you want to share it on the comments, please feel free to do so as we kind of celebrate that together. Because we all have something like that. And for me, my it doesn't feel like Christmas unless is a trip to the Country Club Plaza in Kansas City. Uh, I can count on one hand the number of years that I have not 
gone to the plaza during Advent or Christmas season. And we will be, of course, adding this year to that number because we're not making that trip this year. I've gone when I was a kid growing up with my family. I'm going, I mean, with a, with, as an adult with my own family. And um, actually, my dad, when he was a kid, went with his family. So it's kind of a multi-generation thing. And it just doesn't feel like Christmas unless... Uh, you go walk around the plaza, and, and of course you have to rub the boar's nose or it doesn't count, and then you got to, you know, go into the right stores and check out the bookstore, you got to get your Starbucks or whatnot, you got to go down to where the penguins are and do all the posing with the penguins, walk down to the river, walk across the bridge, sit on Winston Churchill's lap for a second. For some reason, I don't know why we just have to do this. It, it, we do it every year, and it doesn't feel like Christmas unless that happens. We don't get to do that this year. And I know that we've all got those kinds of things this year. This year, this Advent, what a weird Advent this is. Several months ago, when I was planning out what the themes of Advent were going to be, several months, which was, of course, 47 years ago, several months ago, um, the, the theme for today was going to be how busy we are. <laughs> <laughs> was going to be how much like activity there is and how we need to be intentional about clearing away space so that we can, you know, encounter God in the Advent season. Little did I know that that clearing away space was going to be taken care of for us, that our Advent season was going to be simplified, not by our choice, of course, but by the conditions of the global pandemic in which we live. And so, so this Advent is different. So this Advent is weird and we are grieving what we've lost. I know we all are. I'm grieving that trip to the plaza for sure. We're all grieving what we've lost. But I'm going to pose um, what might be an unpopular opinion. Maybe not. Maybe you resonate with this idea a little bit. But in addition to being grief, don't you feel... Maybe just a little bit, I don't know, relieved. It's okay to feel relieved that you don't have to do all the stuff. It's okay to feel a little bit relieved here. I mean, we don't have to try to coordinate everybody's calendar. We don't have to make sure we got the reservations. We don't have to make sure that that sweater fits this year. We don't have to arrange for the babysitters and get the tickets and do all the busyness and the the stuff that goes along with the experiences. I mean, just as we grieve, don't you kind of also feel a little relief? I mean, I, I sure do. I do. And I, I kind of feel bad that I feel relieved, but I feel a little relief along with the grief. It turns out that we can feel both things at the same time because we're missing the events were missing the Advent stuff, but let's be honest, it was exhausting. <laughs> it was exhausting to have to do all that. What if we could rethink it? What if along with the grief, there could be a way we could embrace the relief that we feel at this space that has been opened up for us and maybe experience Advent in a new way in 2020? You know, as, as foster parents, Aaron and I feel grief every time a kid leaves our home. Whether they're going to an adoptive family or being reunited or wherever they're headed, we feel grief that they are leaving, and that is real. And at the same time, to be honest with you, there's relief there as well. Because there's time that's opened up. There's resources that are opened up. We can kind of get to know each other again and say, oh, you live here too? Oh, that's cool. <laughs> I remember you. <laughs> There's a bit of relief there, right? Even along with the grief. And it's okay to feel both things. Anybody who's been a caretaker for someone in the last season of their life kind of gets this too, because that's hard work. It's really hard work to take care of someone as they go. And when they die, yes, you feel grief. Of course you do. You, you feel the pain of that loss and if we're honest, there's a bit of relief there as well. And, and a lot of times, someone in that situation names a sense of guilt or shame at feeling relieved. That, I get that. I, I understand that. We all do. It's okay to feel both things at the same time. I kind of think that's 
Advent 2020. Grief and relief at the same time. But maybe if we accept Advent 2020 with its grief and relief, maybe we, if we accept Advent 2020 with its challenge as also a gift at the same time, a gift so that we can relocate Advent. Maybe we can rediscover the true location of Advent. Maybe if we can embrace the grief and the relief, the challenge and the gift, Maybe we can relocate Advent in the wilderness again. Advent is a wilderness season, after all. We read about it in the prophet Isaiah, who tells the people to be comforted for their struggle is over. The suffering has ended. And names this voice crying in the wilderness to prepare a way of the Lord. There you can hear it. Something has ended and something has yet to begin. We are in between in Isaiah 40 and the preparation is happening in the wilderness of that in-between place. The Gospels pick up this passage. We read Mark today to describe John the Baptist. Mark takes a line out of Isaiah 40. He also takes a bit out of Malachi chapter 3, puts them together as if they're one prophecy tweaks them a little bit and says, now this is about John the Baptist, (laughs) y'all. He does all of that work, all that interpretation of Scripture to point to the voice crying out in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord. Whether it's Isaiah's preparation happening in the wilderness or, or John the Baptist's voice crying out in the wilderness for us to prepare The larger point for us here is that associating these two texts with the season of Advent locates Advent itself in the wilderness. Advent happens in the wilderness. And why is that important? Why wilderness? A biblical scholar by the name of Dr. Emerson B. Powery says, connected to John, that the wilderness location helps establish John as a prophetic outsider who challenges the status quo of urban political centers. John is outside of the structure, outside of the hierarchy, outside of the power when he's in the wilderness. In other words, John is in a place of freedom. The wilderness is a place where we are free from rigidly defined structures and systems where we're free from the hierarchy, where we are free from any prescribed normativity. The wilderness is a place where we are empty of luxury. We are empty of pretension. We are empty of our privilege. We are empty of everything except that which is right in front of us, except for the immediate. I'll confess, I have a guilty pleasure. Since this is a safe space, I'll share this with you. I really love watching those reality television shows where they take a person or people and they put them in the middle of nowhere and then they kind of sit back with their cameras and watch what happens. Ooh, is this one going to die? Woohoo, that's going to be so... No, I know they're not really going to die. I know there's doctors right there. I know they're fine and everything. But they sort of just let them experience this wilderness with nothing except what's right in front of them. And some of them do well, some of them don't do so well, but all of them, all of them, here's what happens every time. Every single person placed in that situation is forced to confront themselves, is forced to ask, who am I here in this nothingness? Here in this emptiness, who am I really? That's what happens in the wilderness. Susan Beaumont has a great book called How to Lead When You Don't Know Where You're Going, which is an amazing book, very timely as well. But she writes about wilderness, and she writes in particular about Moses. Moses' leadership presence during the wilderness wandering was not remarkable for the mileage covered, for the growth of the community under his leadership, or the productivity of the community. Moses' leadership during liminality is remarkable because of the new national identity that he birthed following God's lead. 
See, when you're in the wilderness, free from the expectations of the world, when things have been simplified for us, we can confront ourselves and in so doing, maybe discover who we really are. Maybe be freed to become who we really are. This actually reminds me of another story in the Bible, the story of Babel. Remember the story of the Tower of Babel? They built this big tower trying to reach God. It happens in Genesis 11. It's right after the Noah story, but it's right before we meet Sarah and Abraham for the first time. So it's kind of inserted in between. In this story, they, you know, the people build this tower um, to try to get to God, right? To try to sort of institutionalize the relationship with God. Prior to this, God was very relational, very intimate with the characters of the scripture. And now here is this structure in this urban center that they are building, prescribing what access to God has to actually look like. I don't think the problem with the Babel story is the tower itself, I think the problem with the Babel story is that the tower had become normative. In other words, the prescribed one and only way to access God. And I read that in the phrase that appears in Genesis 11. The people said, let us make a name for ourselves. Let us make a name for ourselves. One name to identify all the people. That phrase points to a human inclination toward sameness. We have a tendency to elevate one particular identity, one particular way to access God, against which all others will be assessed. That one is normal and anything else is deviant. That one is good and anything else is bad. The name that the people are making for themselves in the Babel story is the normative way to access God. In other words, the single right way to be in relationship with God. There's a Mennonite pastor and author in Canada named Jamie Arpan Ricci. He says, one of the deadliest tools of powerful systems is narrow definitions of what is normal and the reduction of difference to deviance. And what is God's response to Babel? God responds to the people of Babel by confusing the languages of the people and scattering them around the, around the world. In other words, God disrupts their attempt to build a normative identity and to prescribe a single divine access point for all people. God deconstructs their structure. God deconstructs their rigidly defined system. And instead, the people are scattered and diversified. This is God's doing. God diversifies people. That's the Babel story. And what does that have to do with wilderness? Well, let's bring it back around to wilderness, shall we? Because it seems to me that every time something needs to be disrupted, God sends it to the wilderness. Think about it. The story of the eviction from Eden. God needed to disrupt this garden life, this idyllic but passive life. How did God do so? Sent Adam and Eve into the wilderness. When the people were slaves in Egypt, God needed to disrupt and deconstruct their slavery identity. And where did that happen? They didn't go straight to the promised land. They spent an entire generation wandering in the wilderness to disrupt what had been. Jesus himself, think about his time in the wilderness, in between what was and his public ministry, 40 days to confront himself, to discover who he really was, to face his temptations and enter back into the world on the other side into public ministry. The wilderness is always a space in between what was and what is yet to be. It's the threshold That line between two rooms, as in the the theme of this Advent series, at the threshold. The English word liminal, by the way, comes from the Latin word for threshold. That line at the bottom of the door. Any space between two others is therefore a liminal space. And Advent, (laughs) Advent is an entire season 
of liminal space, of waiting and preparing for the arrival. And this year, <laughs> Advent 2020 is happening in the wilderness. Advent 2020 is happening in its true biblical location. And no, it's not by our choice, and we grieve that. We've been forced into it. But what if that's a gift? What if that's an opportunity for us to let God disrupt our preconceived notions about what a normal Christmas has to look like? What if it's an opportunity to let God disrupt our preconceived notions about what a normal Christian has to look like? What if it's an opportunity for us to let God disrupt our preconceived notions about what a normal church is supposed to look like? What if we could grieve the loss of what was, of what we do not have this year, but also feel the relief of this space that has been opened up before us because we have a gift. With this challenge, we have a gift of an open space in which to discover who we really are. In this wilderness season, maybe we can truly, for once, prepare the way of the Lord. Maybe every valley can be exalted and Babel's towers be made low. Maybe the uneven ground can become a level place of freedom for all people Maybe in this year's wilderness, the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people shall see it together. The glory of the Lord, as Irenaeus said, is a human being fully alive. Maybe, just maybe, the glory of the Lord will be revealed in this season and all people will truly see it together. It's a gift. It's, it's a gift. We've had the gift of wilderness forced upon us in this challenging year but we've been liberated from what was. And what is to be is still arriving. That's, that's Advent. That's Advent. A space of freedom, creativity, preparation. A voice cries out, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Would you pray with me, please? Oh, Lord, we grieve what we've lost in this Advent season. And at the very same time, oh, Lord, we are grateful for the sense of relief at the space that has been opened up before us where we can breathe, where we can confront ourselves, where we can discover who we are, really. Here in this liminal season, God, make us aware of your presence so that we can truly prepare the way to you in the name of Jesus. By the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.